Good afternoon. At the beginning of my sermon yesterday, I asked the question, who are you? And I was happy to hear a flurry of responses. I'm a child of God. And that's wonderful to hear, and it's wonderful for me to know that you know that, because at our very core, this is our identity as people who are redeemed by Jesus Christ. But it's easy to forget that. And Labor Day is a good time to reflect on what our true identity is, because most of us get our identity from our work. Usually, when you're not in church, if someone asks you the question, who are you or what do you do? You reply with the name of your job or your career. I'm a pastor, I'm a teacher, I'm an electrician, I'm a secretary, I'm a sales representative, and so on. Because we live in a society in which we are defined by our work. Our work makes us who we are, or so the world around us teaches us. If you have a highly respected or high paying job, you feel better about yourself. But if you have a menial or low-paying job, you may almost feel apologetic when you answer the question, who are you, or what do you do? That's why unemployment is so hard for many people, because when they lose their job, they don't know who they are anymore. And the same thing often happens at retirement. People leave their identity at the workplace and end up feeling lost. Jesus once told a parable about someone whose life focused on his career. Jesus talked about a farmer who was already wealthy, but then one year had a bumper crop. He took in more grain than he had room for. So he immediately thought about what he could do. He was going to build bigger barns to hold his harvest, and then he could get rich off of selling it. And then with that money, he could just take life easy. He could eat, drink, and be merry. In other words, his life revolved around the harvest that he had just brought in. Who he was, or who he thought he was, was only about the work he had done. And when he thought about the fruit of his labor, he thought only about himself. Now, the Bible certainly does teach us that we should work to support ourselves. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 we read, you should work with your hands so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders and so that you will not be dependent on anybody. But that is not the only reason that the Bible gives us for working. We are also to earn not only to benefit ourselves, but to help other people. According to the prophet Ezekiel, that was the sin of Sodom. You know, the famous Sodom and Gomorrah. Ezekiel said that the people of Sodom were arrogant, overfed, and unconcerned. They did not help the poor and needy. But we also work not only for ourselves, not only to help for those who cannot provide for themselves, but we also work for God's glory. In the book of Exodus, twice we read the command, Bring the best of the first fruits of your soil to the house of the Lord your God. In other words, Bring the best of your work to the Lord. Don't give him your sloppy seconds. Give him your very best. And by the way, the best way to tithe, the best way to give your 10% to the Lord, is not to first pay all your bills and then look at what's left over that you can give to God, because it'll never be enough. But instead, give God his share first thing. Give him the first fruits out of your paycheck. Then you can figure out what you're going to do with the rest. This is why we celebrate Labor Day. We do not celebrate Labor Day because our jobs make us who we are. We celebrate Labor Day because our labor, our work, provides us with opportunities from what we have earned. Now, we could be like the farmer in Jesus' parable, or it could be like the people of Sodom that Ezekiel spoke against. We could just keep it all for ourselves and get fat and lazy. But, by the way, that didn't work out for either of them. Sodom, together with the sister city of Gomorrah, were, dest were destroyed by fire from the sky for their sin. Their sin of not caring for the poor and needy. 
And as for Jesus' parable, God visited that rich man one night and said, You fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? That is to say, this man was going to die before he could enjoy the luxury he had planned for himself, and then he would have nothing to show for all his work. The different way, of course, is while we are working to ensure that we meet our own needs, we also provide for those who are unable, for whatever reason, to provide for theirs. And we're able to give God the best right off the top. And we do so as a reminder, not only that he is a top priority in our lives, it's a reminder not only that God deserves the very best, but it's a reminder ultimately of who we actually are. We indeed are children of God. And when we give the first and the best of our labors to God, that reminds us and it demonstrates to God that this is exactly who we are. Would you pray with me, please? Lord God, for those of us who are able to work productively, we are grateful for the fruit of our labors and the rich opportunities for all we have to do with what we earn. I'm aware, Lord, that some who may be watching this devotion are those who are not able to work and provide for their own needs. And I pray for them that as they receive what others offer, they can receive it not feeling bad about themselves. You can receive it not as though they are somehow unworthy or less than, but they can receive it joyfully, knowing that God is providing for you also, only in a different way. Amen. Thanks for joining me. We'll talk again later.